let's move on to the next work that is called a prospective randomized trial abdominal versus laparoscopic sacropexy for advanced pelvic organ prolapse. The presenter is Manel Di Biasi from Perugia, Italy. Good morning. Uh, today I'm going to present you our prospective randomized trial which compared the abdominal sacrocolpopexy with the laparoscopic sacrocolpopexy. Uh, as we know, the Cochrane Review recommended the um, sacrocolpopexy as the best, um, best surgical treatment for the vaginal wall prolapse. And in this field as well, the laparoscopic approach was introduced uh, to, with the aim uh, um, of reducing the blood loss, the intraoperative complication, uh, the pain, and the, blend less, uh, the um, hospital stay left. In our study, we included patients with uh, pro or, uh, pelvic organ prolapse with the stage superior to the second, uh, according to with the, pu the POPQ system. Um, we uh, excluded all the patients who can't underwent uh, laparoscopic uh, treatment or uh, myosurgery. surgery. As primary outcome, we evaluate the um, the clinical equivalence between these two approaches uh, by the description of the point C or D um, according with the POPQ system. Uh, secondary outcomes, we evaluate the complication using the clavian dindo classification of surgical complication, the operative time, the intraoperative blood loss, the length of hospital stay, and 30 and 19 days postoperative complication. Before uh, to underwent the, the intervention, we uh, investigated uh, each patient and they all completed a questionnaire to evaluate their POP symptoms. They were all asymptomatic patients, uh, the incontinence, the storage and voiding symptom, and the quality of life. Um, we randomized. 36 patients in the, in the abdominal uh, sacrocolpopexy arm and 37 the laparoscopic one. But one patient in the laparoscopic group uh, was converted due to massive bowel adherences. As we can see in this table, we, um, the, the, our data show a clinical equivalence between these two approaches. Uh, as secondary outcomes, uh, um, as we can see in these diagrams, uh, we have a, a, reduc a reduction of the complication using the, the clavian dindo classification, and as well we have a reduction of the blood, intraoperative blood, lo blood loss and the hospital stay. Um, the only point who is mm, higher in the laparoscopic group is the operating time, which is uh, 100, 119 minutes for the abdominal um, uh, approach versus the 222 in the laparoscopic one. <clears throat> As we can see in this table, uh, we have all the complications we um, uh, emerged uh, during the follow-up. Uh, at the last follow-up, we can stress um, three important points, uh, which are the um, the, the incontinence, which is equivalent for into these two groups, uh, nine patients for each group, and uh, mesh erosion. Uh, another point is, is the recurrence of the cystocele. Uh, we saw only um, cystocele at the stage one or two, and they were all asymptomatic. The, ta the data is a little bit higher in the laparoscopic group than the open surgery group. <clears throat> Eight patients in the first and two patients in the second one. Uh, there is another one randomized trial uh, published by Freeman and colleagues on the International Urogynecology Journal in 2012, uh, which mm, demonstrate the, the same equivalence between these two approaches. In conclusion, in conclusion, the advantages of laparoscopic sacrocolpopexy are represented apart from a cosmetic surgery by a lower rate of postoperative low-grade complication with a similar clinical, clinical excellent outcome as abdominal sacrocolpopexy, but only the long-term results from this ongoing prospective trial could define the definitive role of laparoscopic sacrocolpopexy in the treatment of the high-grade uh, prolapse organ, pelvic organ prolapse. Thanks for the attention.
Thank you, Manuel, for the presentation. There is one question from the bottom. Okay, Keris Glazen from Aberdeen. Um, thank you for presenting a lovely trial. Uh, you would expect me to say the numbers are too small for you to be able to say that there is no difference between these operations. That it is too small to say whether or not there is a difference. But the um, other I'm sorry, can you... Sorry. The voice, oh, thank you. Okay, so you would expect me to say this is too small a trial to be able to conclude, as yes, I think you I did, that there is no difference between these two methods, except for the operating time. Um, you need a trial uh, with, with much, much larger numbers yes, to I say know. that there is no difference. Um, so you have, you, you have just demonstrated that you have been unable to, to show a difference. Yes. The, uh, so that's just a comment. My question, though, is I think that I saw on one of your slides that some of the women were having uh, still... A, so th uh, my question is really, w did all these women have vault prolapse or did some of them have uterine prolapses, which you then treated by hysterectomy, presumably abdominally, before you did the vault procedure to which they were randomized? Okay. Uh, for the first point, um, I know that the patient they are not enough, but this, uh, as I say, this is uh, an ongoing trial. We have to enroll another patients. And for the second point, um, we have patients uh, during the, um, this trial. We have enrolled uh, patient as well to have to to do an hysterectomy too. But I don't report in the, reported the data. Uh, if I remember that um, ten patients in the laparoscopic group and eleven patients in the abdominal uh, group uh, has done the. La, um, underwent the hysterectomy, but concomitant, not before. Okay, so could I ask, when you do report the full trial, that you present the re results separately, according to the women who did and did not have a concomitant hysterectomy at the time of, your, uh, of the surgery that you're randomizing? Because that will enable the results to be okay. more uh, pr properly incorporated into the uh, relevant Cochrane review. Okay, and I agree. There's one question Tara in the front. from Australia. Can I ask you question, two questions, ask, actually? Uh, all your, all, none of your patients are symptomatic at post-op follow-up. Is that correct? What? Um, none of your patients are symptomatic of prolapse at post-op follow-up. Uh, uh, no, no, no patient has um, symptomatic uh, cystocele. Only because it was only a first or second stage at the first or second stage, and they were all asymptomatic. They okay. doesn't report yeah. any symptom uh, about uh, obviously about the uh, about the prolapse. They okay. has another mm, another complication like incontinence yeah. or yeah. other one. Yes. Um, the second question is um, from your data. Stage one to two cystocele and red tissue is only around five percent. Actually, it is really really good. The result. Yes. It, it is actually what the impression that we have from our um, surgical audit. Do you have any explanation for that? Expiration? Uh, Explanation for uh, the good uh, anterior ah, posterior yes, compartment yes. result after yes, uh, the operation. Yes, we have a, um, a very, a very good, uh, very expert laparoscopic surgery. <laughs> I'm not. Another question from the end of the. Hey, Leas Yaren is UK. I'm uh, sorry, can Okay. Could you comment on the length of hospital stay? Okay. I reported the data here. The hospital stay were less for the um, for the laparoscopic group, uh, as we can see here. Um, uh, Six point three days in the abdominal sacrocolpopessi and uh, versus four point six days for the laparoscopic one. It, this is due, in my opinion, to the um, uh, to the uh, the pain, the reducing on the pain during after the the intervention, and, uh, and reducing of the blood loss and complication after the intervention uh, is a consequence of the reduction of the complication. For me. But I think 4.6 days after laparoscopic surgery is a prolonged hospital stay. How do you justify this in your country? How do you? I'm sorry. I didn't How know. do you justify 4.6 days hospital stay after laparoscopic uh, yes, surgery in your country? <laughs> yes, maybe, but it's our, our data. I... 
Yeah, sorry, Peter Dietz from Sydney. Um, please don't don't feel attacked by what I'm saying. Please don't. Okay, it's not meant like that. It is meant as, it is meant as <laughs> it is meant as constructive criticism. Yes. I really mean it as constructive criticism. But this is a good but, introduction. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Sometimes that has to be said. <laughs> uh, I've done surgical audits since 1986, mm -hmm. and I followed up results of probably 50 different surgeons. The only explanation, don't, please don't take it. <laughs> the only explanation I have for your results is, a, is an insufficient bar salva. Full stop. Do you see what I mean? Do you see what I mean? Because what you're saying is that 94.5% of those 70-odd women who had a big prolapse operated mm -hmm. have stage zero for the posterior compartment at two years out. I'm sorry, that doesn't even exist in young nullips. It doesn't even exist in 18-year-old nullips. It doesn't exist. So, so that means I think, you know, I'm sure you're doing good surgery there. Okay. But, but you've got to get your assessment right. You've got to get them to push properly, or even better do imaging. But by all means, just get them to push properly. Because these women did not push properly, I'm sorry. Their, their post-op assessment is not right, I'm sorry. And I, I, I mean this as a constructive criticism. OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, but I think she's going to comment because she's the main author. Sorry, I'm Constantini Awan. I am the major editor of this uh, paper, and I think that I, we need a comment on this last point in the sense that uh, in the post-operative period the patient are able to push and uh, I can say that our data are really good there are same patient with state zero prolapse post-operative yeah and I think that it depends I think that we are honest because we have said that a number, a certain group of patients have still stage two. So I think that how I reported the stage two, I reported the stage zero. In the sense that there are some women with after sacropexy, which has no type of uh, prolapse. So I can invite the colleagues in my department, and I will show him. The last, the last question from the end. Um, can I, just as a physician, bounce a question that um, if you were to valsalva the way Hans Peter Dietz valsalvas, which you know you go into orbit, it, <laughs> isn't there a danger that your beautiful prolapse will just burst forth into your hands? <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've done it about, what, 10, 15,000 times since 1986, and nobody's got into orbit no, yet. No, 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 Hans Peter, it's because they don't complain. <laughs> I know. And, and, and no serious complications either. But you see, this, this is an important question. Yeah. This is yeah. a really important question. And um, Stefano, you know how we do it. You've, I've done a course with you. You know how we do it. You see, the problem is, if you want to standardize Valsalva, how do you standardize it? To 50% or to 30%? Or do you try and get to maximum organ descent? Yeah. Well, of course we need to try to get to maximum because that's the only way to standardize it, isn't it? Or do you just do a one-second Valsalva and the other unit does a two-second Valsalva, the other unit does a three-second Valsalva? This is precisely why we've had so much misinformation and so much useless outcomes presented after prolapse surgery. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. It's difficult, though, to try to standardize uh, Valsalva. But I, I wouldn't continue too much, actually, although it's interesting, but I think... No, I know, just, like, just, uh, okay. just a little comment. Just because it's you. I, I think that at the end, uh, this is really uh, nice... Uh, uh, experiences, different experiences. I, I don't think that it's important. And uh, I think that it's not important to have a stage zero, one, or two, or, you know. I think that the most important things is the functional results. We are talking about an objective results. I don't think that it's so important. I think that many, many women has a stage two prolapse because she had two pregnancies, 
and they are completely asymptomatic, and they have no problem. So the problem is that we report an objective results. The most important thing is the functional results, a and that it's not the prolapse. You know, I think that if you see in the tables there are storage symptoms, voiding sym symptoms, and bulging symptoms. What I mean when I say that uh, stage two asymptomatic, I say that this patients has no bulging symptoms, has no problems, has no storage symptoms, or are voiding symptoms, you know. Yeah. If you perform a Valsava or not, I don't think that it's important. Okay, okay. Well, I'm, I'm sure you can continue your discussion after the session. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.